Thank you very much for being here. This is the. This might be actually the last session of the WTO Public Forum, and I would like to welcome you all to our session on how investment promotion agencies and trade institutions could leverage digital tools to create sustainable supply chain partnerships. We have been partnering with the EIF of WTO to put together this session. As you know, we have little time left to reach climate goals, and every actor is extremely important. Two very important actors are investment promotion agencies, if I may, as we are proudly the Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, as well as trade institutions. Therefore, we do believe that they can take a very important role to make sure that we can utilize some digital tools to make sure we can create some sustainable supply chain partnerships. They are extremely well connected with the private sector while they are representing their governments. We do believe that they can be taking a very important position to make it happen, to make these partnerships happen. Digitalization, of course, has ushered in a new era of connectivity and efficiency. It has transformed the way we work, the way we live, and the way we engage with the world. Today we come together to explore how these digital tools can serve as catalysts for creating sustainable supply chain partnerships that benefit not only our organizations, but our, also our communities and our planets. In this room, in this small room, but very beautiful room, we have the collective knowledge we have the best case experiences. We have international organizations being represented as well as the private sector. From private sector side, we have Excellency Madame Caroline King. She is the um, head of global head of business development and government affairs, and she is also proudly member of WIPA Business Advisory Board. I would like to welcome her. We also have, from the international organization side, we have Mr. Radnagar Atikari, who is also our host, our partner, our great support for our work, for our projects for the LDCs, for our project with the LDCs. And he's the executive director of the IF Executive Secretariat. And of course, we also have a WIPA member, Investment Promotion Agency, Madame Nejati Soadiki, who is the Director General of ANPI Comoros. And we also have a representative from Cambodia, Mr. Kemwichet Long, the Director General for International Trade at the Ministry of Commerce of the Royal Government of Cambodia, if I may. I would like to welcome you all. I'm not going into too much details of your CVs. There are brilliant CVs, but uh, let's just focus on the discussions. Let's just focus on your knowledge. This is going to be more beneficial for all the participants. I would like to thank you again for participating. Let's start with the first question, if I may, to Mr. Atikari. Mr. Atikari, with your extensive background in international trade and LDC perspectives, could you share specific digitalization strategies or tools that have proven effective to help enhance sustainability of supply chains. Thank you again for being a great host and welcoming you. Thank you, uh, Smile, and I being a host, and he keeps insisting that you are the host. Uh, we are the co-host, actually. <laughs> so uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you, uh, distinguished uh, members of the panel as well as participants. Um, what I would like to you know, mention in relation to your first question is that, uh, yes, digital strategy and tools uh, can definitely help enhance sustainability of supply chain. Uh, but what is needed, first and foremost, is the, is the digital sort of, you know, digital inclusion or, you know, preventing a, a kind of a, you know, bringing LDCs into the digital mainstream. So what needs to be done is to bring them from digital marginalization to digital mainstream, right? 
So this is important in the context of the fact that LDCs, despite significant changes or achievements that have been made so far, uh, it's still two thirds. I mean, if you look at glass half full, you will say one third people in LDCs are connected. Uh, but then, if you look at half empty, two thirds are not connected. Right? So that's one of the things that need to be resolved, and it takes time and uh, progress is um, uh, there. But then it is very slow. That's the number one. Number two, look at the potential. You know, the research conducted by UNSCAP uh, you know, in Bangkok, they came up with this finding that if you digitize end-to-end -end trade transaction on an average, end-to-end -end entire trade transaction on an average, it is almost equivalent to planting of 1.5 trees, right? In the Asia-Pacific region, and that's where the research was done, if you digitalize all the end-to-end -end transaction, trade transaction, it will be equivalent to saving 13 million tons of carbon um, CO2. So that would be a huge saving. But uh, despite all of these challenges, we have contributed in, in our own little way um, to help in the sustainability of uh, supply chain through digitization. I just want to provide three examples. One is the paperless trade. What we've done in Vanuatu is, that, is to help them to uh, establish electronic single window. And this project was actually initially supported by us. They were able to mobilize additional resources from the government of Australia and the World Bank and others. Then Ongtad, our partner, they implemented the project by installing the Ashikuda model and everything, right? So as a result of which, what happened was that, you know, the biosecurity certification, the paper, um, <clears throat> paper formalities were reduced by 95%. And for cargo clearance, paper formalities were completely done away with, with everything was digitalized as a result of which. And then on top of that, what has happened is that for biosecurity certification, the trips that various businesses needed to take in order to obtain those certification and the paperwork done, that has been reduced by 86%. And in the case of cargo clearance, it's completely done away with, right? So as a result of which, the now time taken for pro providing the certificate, it used to take six days, now it has come down to as little as 10 minutes. So that's one example of how we, our little support has contributed to enhance the uh, uh, you know, sust sustainability of supply chain. And then this has also resulted in almost six tons of uh, carbon um, uh, CO2 being reduced. So that's one example. And if this can be scaled up in other countries uh, also, as well as in um, the other countries in the Pacific, as well as elsewhere, you know, there will be a huge impact. That's number one. Number two, we have supported the government of Rwanda to, uh, to put in place what is known as e-waste policy, right? And then once that e-waste policy was put in place, they um, uh, invited a company from uh, United Arab Emirates to and enter into a kind of a PPP, public-private partnership modality, whereby they are now able to reuse plastic and then some of the metals, uh, particularly uh, are converted into iron bars for the construction of schools and, uh, as well as new airports and <clears throat> all the hazardous waste, and they have also found the mechanism how to destroy and how to uh, safely destroy um, the hazardous waste. So that's another example. And the third one is from my own country, Nepal. What has happened is that we supported them project um, for the traceability of, enhancing traceability of tea, which would help them eventually to increase their export of organic tea and to reduce the rejection rate, and which is also an important component of supply chain. Um, uh, sustainability. So what we've done is to help them to uh, 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 put in place a system of traceability which is based on digital technology. And as a result of which now they, uh, I mean, this project is still ongoing and they are quite encouraged uh, by this and many companies are now receiving inquiries from their buyers, you know, which would eventually pave the way for them to be able to export. So these are a few examples that I want to share right now, and I'll stop here in the interest of time. Thank you very much for sharing these examples in one water, one when Nepal. It's, uh, it's also, should, we should also note it that progress is, of course, there, but it's going very slow. Let's 
also try to listen from uh, a representative from uh, from an LDC, actually, as we have Madame uh, Suadiki with us. Um, as someone with the expertise in business law, could you elaborate on how adapting to changing needs and regulations impacts Ampicomoros, and how can legal processes be streamlined and made more investor friendly through digitalization in the Comoros? Thank you very much. Je vais m'exprimer en S'il vous plaît, vous pouvez parler en français. Mon collègue Raphaël va nous aider pour la traduction. Je sais que certaines personnes dans la salle comprennent d'ailleurs. Oui, oui. Si ce n'est pas une majorité, donc je vais représenter les, les, les PMA et plus particulièrement les PMA francophones. Alors, pour répondre à, à votre question, je vais, je vais commencer d'abord par, par vous remercier Waipa et le CIR pour avoir organisé euh, cette session qui est euh, extrêmement importante et dont le sujet est très pertinent, et euh, de nous permettre de, de nous exprimer sur un, un sujet qui est également euh, extrêmement euh, important. Euh, notre, euh, notre collègue, le secrétaire exécutif de, du CIR, vient de parler de, de guichet unique euh, et de ce que la digitalisation euh, apporte, euh, notamment en permettant de dématérialiser, donc de ne plus utiliser le papier et donc de, de préserver euh, nos forêts euh, au fur et à mesure. Okay. Au fur et à mesure, peut-être. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to apologize in advance because I'm not a professional interpreter, interpreter, but uh, I'll do my best. Thank you. So, uh, Madam Swadiki was thanking uh, WIPA and the EIF for this uh, session, which has a, a very interesting and important subject. Uh, so, as mentioned by the executive director of the EIF, uh, he mentioned um, digitalization allowed to dematerialize um, um, operations. And then, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, et donc, pour arriver à ce résultat de la dématérialisation, nous, nos pays, nous sommes dans l'obligation tous de, de, de réformer nos réglementations. Et c'est le travail de nos agences de promotion des investissements de faire en sorte d'améliorer le climat des affaires. Donc, la digitalisation, ça pose plusieurs défis. Il faut savoir que quand on veut digitaliser, euh, on doit s'assurer que pour que ces procédures soient plus rapides, pour qu'elles fassent gagner du temps, pour qu'elles soient plus transparentes, on doit aussi euh, faire en sorte que euh, des questions telles que la cybersécurité euh, soient prises en compte. Euh, il y a des questions euh, très pratiques qu'on doit pouvoir intégrer pour que ces solutions puissent fonctionner, euh, des questions telles que la signature électronique qui doit pouvoir être reconnue par nos États, euh, des questions telles que la réforme des systèmes de paiement aussi, parce que qui dit digitalisation dit pouvoir faire les paiements en ligne pour éviter euh, de se déplacer, parce que finalement, euh, la durabilité, euh, c'est vrai, c'est euh, tous ces arbres qui ne vont pas être euh, coupés pour faire du papier, mais c'est également tous ces déplacements qu'on ne sera pas obligé de faire parce qu'on pourra faire nos procédures directement euh, derrière nos ordinateurs. Si on parle de chaînes d'approvisionnement, euh, on est obligé de penser également à la question du e-commerce. Euh, et le e-commerce nécessite de réglementer également dans nos États pour prévoir quel est le régime qui s'applique aux transactions qui sont faites à travers Internet. Et tous nos pays doivent pouvoir se mettre euh, aux normes et pouvoir se mettre à niveau en adoptant des réglementations euh, dans ces domaines-là. Il y a également la question des télécommunications qui sont, euh, qui sont essentielles. Um, so yes, in regards to the uh, dematerialization, so uh, the countries um, uh, have to have to reform, have to to apply some reforms, uh, and that is one of the role of the IPAs. Uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, we, they have to act more uh, rapidly, uh, with more transparency, uh, and there's also the question of cybersecurity that has to be taken into account. Um, 
as well as the question of electronic signature that needs to be recognized also by the government. Um, there's also the challenge uh, linked to the um, system of payment, to pay online, of course, uh, because uh, sustainability, it's, it's about you know, avoiding trees to be to be cut, but also uh, uh, to f facilitate the procedures. Um, in regards to the value chains, uh, it's also touch upon uh, e-commerce, um, and all the the governments need to to apply some rules um, and to to be up to date. Etc. Et Donc, il est aussi euh, important d'adapter la, la réglementation que d'intégrer des solutions logicielles, techniques, euh, qui permettent euh, d'aboutir à la digitalisation. Donc, très rapidement, euh, je vais quand même citer euh, l'exemple des Comores, euh, qui avons mis en place des systèmes de guichets uniques, euh, autant pour le commerce extérieur. Euh, donc, on a connecté euh, différents services à la Direction générale des douanes, mais aussi pour d'autres procédures telles que la création d'entreprise hein, qui est essentielle euh, au niveau de l'implantation, euh, où on a mis en place également ces systèmes de, de guichets uniques. Euh, je finirai avant peut-être de passer à d'autres questions, de dire que euh, que l'on soit PMA ou que l'on soit pays en développement ou pays développé, euh, on ne peut pas échapper à cet impératif de la digitalisation et que euh, aujourd'hui euh, les pays sont donc en concurrence les uns avec les autres et que euh, quand euh, le pays voisin euh, a mis en place une solution donc, qui permet euh, d'importer, d'exporter, de commercer ou d'investir, euh, de faire du business en, en une heure et que nous, on est à côté et qu'il nous faut un mois, euh, forcément, on va être rayé de la carte euh, des affaires et donc on est obligé euh, de s'adapter. Mais il y a... Euh... Thank you very much. So, uh... Um, Swadiki was saying that uh, so yeah, government have to adapt uh, their uh, reg um, regulation and also to adapt their digital solutions. Uh, so she gave the example of Comoros, which has in place uh, a, a single window system uh, for for uh, external trade and also uh, to connect with. Um, uh, um, uh, with the customs, thank you, and also to help create uh, companies. Um, but she was saying that in general, maybe LDCs, developed countries, or any other country, it is important and it, it has to move to digital because the countries are in competition between each other, meaning that if one country has a solution and can have procedures done in an hour while the country itself needs a month to do the same thing, then uh, they will be left behind. So I have to, to, to apply all those. Peut-être pour conclure en disant que le digital permet de se faire concurrence, quel que soit le niveau de, de développement, même pour les pays qui ont raté le, le train de la révolution industrielle. On dit souvent qu'on peut rattraper le train de la révolution numérique. Pour preuve, aujourd'hui, on arrive à mettre en place des solutions euh, similaires, euh, quelle que soit la catégorie ou quel que soit le niveau de développement euh, du, du pays. Et donc, ça permet réellement euh, à ces différents pays de se mettre au même niveau euh, sur ce genre euh, d'outils qui sont devenus nécessaires dans, dans l'utilisation euh, pour euh, promouvoir euh, les chaînes de valeur ou euh, pour faciliter euh, les chaînes euh, d'approvisionnement durable. So digital is also a way to put in competition all countries together, um, uh, even if um, all countries can be in competition together, uh, maybe LDC or whatever, they are all on the same style because um, it is possible to catch up on the digital transformation and uh, all the countries can be uh, equal. Thank you very much, Madam Swadiki. Thank you very much, Rafael. I mean, although you're not a professional interpreter, you're doing a great job. Thank you for that, especially. And we are here also to listen best case experiences, and we have Mr. Long representing Cambodia. And um, actually, one of the best practices that I have in my notes is the supplier's database with sustainable dimensions that was developed by the Council 
for development of Cambodia to improve the linkages between foreign firms and domestic suppliers. Uh, if I would like to come to my question, Cambodia's commitment to climate goals trade is evident, also given its vulnerability to climate change. Can you provide insights into the specific actions taken by the Cambodian government to address these challenges? And how, to, how do these actions align with the greener regulations and international agreements like ASEAN? The floor is yours, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ismail, for, for giving me the floor here. Uh, firstly, it is my pleasure to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Well, uh, I have to say it is really fortunate uh, for me to, to, to speak here at this session because uh, I get to share with you uh, our new social and economic policy agenda that the, the Royal Government of Cambodia just rolled out, in fact, just rolled out in August of this year. Uh, what we call the Pentagon strategy. So the tagline for this strategy is growth, employment, equity, efficiency, and sustainability. So uh, the themes of our session here today, in fact, it fits quite well into the strategy that we uh, have just rolled out. Uh, the strategy is to support the implementation of what we call Cambodia Vision 2050 which is our aspirations to become a high-income country. Uh, with response to the questions, I just want to highlight a number of factors uh, that influence the formulation of the strategy that I just mentioned. First is the geo-economic fragmentation and the de uh, globalization. Uh, this, this kind of uh, trends, uh, it impacts the flow of goods, services, and investment. In fact, uh, it also caused the supply chain disruptions, which is uh, something that we are talking here today to discuss way how you know we can uh, solve this. Uh, second is the digital transformations, uh, because as we know, digital digitalization has increased its uh, significant role in uh, economic activities, business, and government governance. So it's everywhere. Uh, the third is environmental and climate change, uh, which is uh, the main question that is uh, addressed to me. Uh, well, I just want to go a little bit deeper into the strategy. Uh, as it names, the name suggests, it is shaped like a pentagon. So there are many pentagons, and there are subsets of pentagons, uh, all of them with five sides. And each side is uh, con include a strategic objective that the government wishes to achieve. Uh, because there are number <laughs> too many pentagons in the strategy, I'm just focusing on what we call Pentagon number four. So the Pentagon number four is on resilience, sustainability, and inclusive development. And particularly, uh, side number five of this Pentagon number four, I hope you don't get confused <laughs> uh, with uh, all these pentagons and sides. But pen, uh, the side number five of this Pentagon number four uh, it focuses on ensuring environmental sustainability and readiness uh, for responding to climate change, as well as the promotion of green economy. So it's very important, uh, the strategy objective, uh, especially you know, in terms of responding to environmental and climate change challenges. And it's, so, it's also give a very clear indication on where Cambodia is heading. You know, that is to transition into a resi resilient, sustainable, and inclusive green economy. Uh, there, there's another one that probably related to the theme of this, uh, uh, this session, but for the interest of time, I'll not go through that Pentagon number two, which is on economic diversification, and competitiveness enhancement. But I just want to touch upon the uh, sectors that we are looking to promote and to attract investments. Uh, because there is also the law on investment, which, uh, which was promulgated in 2021, so it's, it's quite new. So in this law on investment, we are looking to promote and attract you know, investment in priority sectors. And also we are looking, you know, if, if there are investment in these priority sectors, the government will also provide a lot of incentives as well. So uh, I just want to highlight a few sectors, uh, which we call these priority sectors. Uh, one is the digital industries, so it's really related 
you know, it, it's quite relevant, you know, digitalization and climate change and how we can utilize digital, uh, digital technologies to, uh, to become greener, uh, to strengthen supply chain resilience and all these things. And uh, the second uh, priority sector is on the environmental management and protection, biodiversity, conservation, and circular economy. And, and, and then the third one that I want to highlight is green energy, technology, uh, investment in green technology, and technology that contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigations. Uh, so uh, these are some of the, uh, you know, strategy that we have in place uh, to promote uh, green transitions. Uh, I'm not sure I, I have more time, but if, if you don't mind, i just go quickly to what we're doing at the regional level, because, uh, because you know, Cambodia is part of ASEAN. So ASEAN, we have the 10 country in Southeast Asia, uh, plus Timor-Leste that will become uh, the 11th member very soon. Uh, in ASEAN, we are currently formulating what we call the ASEAN Community uh, Vision Post-2025 because we have, until now, the Vision 2025 for, for ASEAN Community, but uh, we are looking forward. So the, the next vision will be a 20-year strategy. Uh, will be Vision 2045. Uh, so this, so we have, like, strategies and tools so what we have at the uh, regional uh, uh, at the regional level is what we call the ASEAN framework on circular economy for the ASEAN economic community. I uh, just want to highlight three strategic goals of having, you know, for, for this uh, ASEAN framework on circular economy. If, uh, you, if you like, we can get the perspectives for the ASEANs in the second part, or okay. I can also leave you continue, for, because it's going to be in the part of the Okay, all right, all right. But I can also leave it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as maybe. You, as you prefer. Uh, uh, okay, let, let, me, let me just finish the argument sure. part. Yeah, okay, of course. Because uh, we'll be, uh, it's going to finish soon. Uh, so sustain, uh, resilient, resource efficient, and sustainable, uh, sustainable growth. That's the aim of the ASEAN framework on circular economy uh, in, in, uh, in a summarized form. But then again, we also have the ASEAN strategy for carbon neutrality. So this, this carbon neutrality strategy, is, is, uh, it has the aim to accelerate inclusive transitions to green economy, fostering sustainable growth, uh, and trade competitiveness for our members. We have to understand that you know, the, the trends that we have here is that you know, a lot of focus have been put upon green transitions, and we have to turn that into you know, opportunities. So there's opportunities for ASEAN as a region to attract more green investment into the region, and therefore, you know, uh, provide all the benefits to to the people. So uh, I just want to just, if you don't mind, uh, just just one point on the uh, sustainability database. That was uh, actually it was supported by the World Economic Forum in in cooperation with the Council of Development of Cambodia, which is the uh, investment uh, promotion uh, investment development agency for Cambodia, actually. Uh, so we have a lot of MSME who actually, you know, registered to the database and provide all sorts of sustainability elements, you know, from whether they are using organic material, you know, whether they are using solar energy, you know, all these sustainability elements are provided. And then if, if there are, you know, buyers or someone who are interested in those products can go in and check out who is uh, doing what in terms of, you know, implementing sustainability uh, strategies for themselves. And then obviously there are, you know, contact information that, you know, both parties can, can contact one another. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing these good examples on uh, Cambodia's vision and strategy to, exceed, to, to, to somehow reach the sustainability goals. I mean, as we were recently speaking in a previous session that we have been, uh, I have been speaking of EIF, I mean, the connection between the private sector and the uh, investment promotion agencies and uh, trade institutions, I think, is the key. We must make sure that interaction between these two institutions are there. I mean, and uh, time to time we may not be sure, we may not be 100% sure whether the connection is really there. And we would like to understand this 
whether it is from your perspective, uh, Ms. King, as a private sector uh, part of the discussion, uh, what role can be played by the private sector and vice versa? Perhaps it should be the role of IPAs, role of the trade institutions as well should be there. Also, it can be also private sector should also have some, some things to do. So how do you see this equation? Uh, where should be the, this interconnection can be further enhanced in your opinion? I've been with SAP about 23 years now, uh, so I have had the chance to see uh, the evolution of this company's interaction with the public sector. Uh, in the early years, our founders were like every IT startup. They really didn't want to have anything to do with government. Um, Hasso Plattner, still very active in the background, many of you may know him, always accused me of uh, bringing yet another goose uh, breeding project to his desk. I don't know where he got that expression from in German. It's a little funnier, I suppose, in, uh, than in English. Now, look where we have come. Uh, it's unbelievable. We cannot do the business without a purpose anymore. It's a, it's a 180 degree change for me. They used to laugh at me in, in investor relations when I said you have to look at the ROI of sustainability. There is a triple bottom line. They thought I was crazy. <laughs> I have, my, I have my, uh, my just desserts these days. It's in, it, it, and why is that? What has happened? Uh, well, of course, it's a win-win for a company like SAP to invest in these technologies and to sell them. We're an enabler. We, we offer these tools. Um, and it's important for an SAP to recruit new young talents. And the digital skills problem is a huge one globally. So we, do a, we spend a lot of money on training, even school kids coding uh, in primary schools. We never used to do that. We always just focused on the university students. But the skills gap is a huge issue. We also need governments to take the lead. We need them to be investors in digital transformation themselves. You know, we've, we've had this climate challenge a long time, but I never really saw much change with government interest in digital transformation until COVID. And then suddenly everybody, oh my God, you know, we're still working with Excel and pencils. And, and uh, we, our, it says SAP is, is the world leader in business software. Uh, it's, we've been around for 50 plus years. I, I was told I should say this again in case some of you don't know because it's a B2B company. So unlike Microsoft and Oracle, and we're at that category, it's, we're not so well known because we don't sell to the consumers. We don't make phones. We provide the backbone for any organization, no matter how small, to quote the Grinch, uh, and no matter how big, for um, personnel management, financial accounting, logistics public services and private sector, but our public sector business is still like 4% of our global revenues because governments were cautious about the investment, mm, not always the technology leaders in the know-how side, and frankly, we also had a lot of trouble selling software when governments realized that it makes all of their processes transparent. And corruption is still a huge issue out there, so it's an interesting discussion at many levels. But now the technology is moving so quickly. If we don't work hand in hand on the standards, I'm so happy to be here, and I had a great conversation with the ITU today. We must work hand in hand on the standards. AI is the world's biggest disruptor for all of us, including a big old company like SAP. If we don't get ahead of the curve on those standards and we don't all work together on harmonization and a level playing field, we're all going to be in trouble. We're not going to be in control of that technology, where the technology will control us. So these days, we need to work together. We need to work together on the climate goals. Uh, governments can't manage it without the private sector technology, and we can't manage it without the financing and the coordination. There's so much patchwork, wonderful initiatives, but it's overwhelming for a private sector player like SAP. Where do we participate? We don't have dollars to throw at everything. Where do we get the biggest bang for the buck? And we can't, we have been asked, we are a big uh, partner of UNICEF, um, we have been asked to copy and paste this program for other UN family organizations. We say, well, UNICEF, you can speak to the other UN family organizations. Why, why do we have to do that? So there's a lot of work to be done, and we have to do it hand in hand. Thank you so much. We can't control ourselves. Perhaps technology controls us. It's, it's, it, can, it can be a better option, perhaps. 
All right. Let's see. By the way, if you have any questions at any moment, I think it's going to be more open discussion. It can it can lead us to a better and more open discussion side. I'm going to continue with the second part of our questions, if I may. And the um, second question for Mr. Atikari. Can you explain how LDCs can attract green investments and promote exports growth by utilizing digital technology? I mean, it's a very direct question, but I'm sure with your expertise, with your background, you can make it more flourishing and mm -hmm. with thank more you. content in it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And this is uh, this is our bread and butter, actually. Now, <clears throat> uh, I'll give you uh, three examples. Uh, uh, you know, with the help of three examples, I want to explain this uh, question, actually respond to this question. Uh, something that we do is called Diagnostic Trade Integration Study, right? And this is the, the, the foundational work that we ad do at the country level. For those of you who do not know EIF very well, I just want to mention this, that the moment any country walks into the EIF and then starts asking for the support, then the first thing we ask them to do is to conduct diagnostic work because we need to understand clearly what are their needs, what are their priorities, what are their challenges, right? So this is the document that provides that. And then we update it regularly, three to five years for each LDC. So, uh, and we only work in least developed countries. And there are 46 countries where we work. These are least developed countries and five recently graduated countries. So what the DTIS um, does is to identify a priority action matrix, right? What needs to be done? Right? Then various sectors, in sectoral intervention or intervention that are cross-cutting in this. Digital transformation could be one of the intervention and then for which, you know, there are X number of things that need to be done. For example, um, you know, and then uh, infrastructure development, be it clean energy or any other kind of energy, that could be another area. Or, or green uh, sort of industrialization, that could be another. So there could be various areas, and I'm agriculture and what have you, right? So what we can possibly do, we can do it better actually at it by uh, helping these countries not only to prepare the DTIS, uh, but also to uh, to cost the intervention. You know, all everything is budgeted, and they should, uh, you know, they should then very well define, you know, where the money is going to come from. Is it going to come from the public sources? If it's public source, where is, whether it's going to come from the government treasury or from aid for trade resources, such as the one that we provide, or from other um, uh, official development assistance, or from the private sector, right? Or impact investment, uh, blended finance, and what have you. So once that is done, then it is easier for the government to prepare, start preparing projects and you know, then inviting investment from not only from the foreign investor but also local investors. That's one way through which uh, the green investment can be mobilized and with the eventual goal of uh, helping them to enhance their export. That's number one. Number two, investment promotion and facilitation, the kind of work that we are doing together. But then, you know, that's more at the international level that we are working, but also at the national level, what we have is the national implementation unit and the national implementation arrangement in place. And one of the responsibilities for them is to prepare, you know, I mean, uh, revise legislation and procedure in order to make their environment more business friendly. You know, a country such as Cambodia, who is a beneficiary of the EIF, has done it very well. Comoros, very few other countries have done it, right? So that's one. But I, here I want to provide, that's a general approach, and as a result of which so our, our interventions, some of them have managed to sort of improve their investment climate. But very specific example that I want to provide here is the example of Bhutan. What they did, that they did was through our support, you know, they put in place what is known as e-regulation. And e-regulation is basically a digital tool and basically a website where you have all the information, and particularly for the investment. They work together with Ongtar, and what they were able to come up with is a kind of a, um, a, a, a website where you have all the information. It's, it is a great transparency exercise. Huh? It has all the rules and procedure on the business registration, and then it has uh, on, uh, on, on fiscal matters, tax-related matters, uh, land acquisition, everything on a single website page. Then 
that was also then you know, circulated to the uh, various missions and, and embassies of Bhutan elsewhere, I mean, in, in wherever they are present. And this actually initiative was launched in November 2020 at the height of the pandemic, November 2020. So we have somebody from Bhutan here if you want to ask more questions. So, and then uh, between that period and uh, August 2022, uh, that's the time when I, we have the latest data, they were able to mobilize investment worth 1.2 billion nultrum, which is equivalent to 365 billion US dollars. And part of that was local investment, but part of that was foreign investment also. We haven't done accounting as to how much of it was green, green investment and how much of it was brown investment or, or black investment, but then definitely that's one area worth uh, exploring. And, and this is um, something that I want to highlight. And the other uh, is the kind of work that we are doing together with WIPA. So we are building capacity of investment promotion agencies to to, to be able not only to attract uh, for, you know, foreign investment, but also to retain them by providing aftercare services and everything, right? So this is, this is covering, the, you know, initially we started out with, the, with Anglophone countries, then we realized that we haven't done anything in Francophone countries. We now started, and then we are now happy to know that our Francophone countries are also quite capable. You know, we have the DG of uh, the National Investment Promotion Agency of Comoros who would, who would explain uh, in further details. And then we are also working together with ONGTAD, which is our partner, and then WIPA as well as UNIDO and other six agencies all together in order to promote investment on sustainable development center or sectors. When we talk about sustainable development sectors, one of them is definitely uh, the green sector. And finally, Finally, what we can also do is that we can provide tiny little money, you know, a drop in the ocean, not a drop in the ocean, drop in the glass, right? So 1.5 million, uh, up to 1.5 million dollar that we, we have provided, and in some cases even 3 million. So we provide that money to de-risk investment so that, you know, it will help uh, the private sector to jump in, you know. Then the private sector uh, would say that, okay, you've taken the first loss bit, and then, you know, the, 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 the government has put in some money, and there's a, some public investment. Then it becomes attractive for them to make investment. And this is the kind of blended finance that, you know, we think is going to be the future. I mean, just the way EI is going to be the future of technology, I think blended finance is going to be the future of investment. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atikari. This is a project that we have been always proud about, the, the joint project that we've been doing together with the EIF, and to make sure that the IPAs can also coordinate, let's say, efforts together with the NIUs and the other institutions in the area. Therefore, we have always put, let's say, private sector in the middle of whatever we do. I mean, you have been one of the uh, great partners of, of, of this project. Therefore, we always hope that this is going to be turning into a useful and operational efforts that we've been putting together with the important support of EIF. And I would like to continue with my next question for you, uh, Madam Suwaliki. Um, as Vice Presidency of RIAP, uh, what collaborative initiatives or digital platforms have been effective in promoting investment in emerging economies or LDCs, and how these experiences benefit other countries seeking to attract investment? If you have any examples. Alors, je vais revenir sur quelque chose qui a été dit à ma gauche par Madame Caroline King. Merci. Euh, en, en introduction, c'est que le, la digitalisation, pour nous, les agences de promotion des investissements, ça sert deux objectifs. Donc, le premier, c'est la simplification des procédures, mais le deuxième, c'est la transparence. C'est la transparence. Et cette transparence, on l'obtient par la disponibilité de l'information et de la même information pour tous. Raphaël. Thank you very much. So, uh, be, before, before, before everything, uh, Madame Swadiki wanted to, to, to come back to what was mentioned uh, by the representative of uh, SAP. Um, so that uh, digitalization for IPAs. So digitalization for IPAs has, 
as two objectives. One is to simplify the procedures, and the second one is transparency. But transparency can be obtained uh, by having available uh, information and, uh, and the same information. Et donc, grâce à, aux différentes organisations qui réunissent les agences de promotion des investissements, euh, WIPA en est une, euh, il y a une organisation des agences francophones de promotion de l'investissement. Nous, nous sommes aussi membres des agences de promotion des investissements de CONESA. Euh, on peut mutualiser, mettre en commun les moyens pour développer des plateformes qui diffusent cette information. Donc, nous allons avoir des sites web, des portails ou d'autres choses qui permettent de renseigner sur les opportunités d'investissement, sur les procédures, sur les coûts des procédures, puisqu'on a parlé ici de, de la corruption, les coûts des procédures, les opportunités, les banques de projets, etc., etc., à travers ces plateformes qu'on développe en commun. Mais la deuxième chose qui est très importante, hormis cette information qu'on peut mettre en commun à travers ces plateformes, je pense, c'est de pouvoir bénéficier de renforcement de capacités tous ensemble pour pouvoir euh, utiliser euh, certains de ces moyens euh, digitaux qui donnent accès à l'information. Et là, je vais reprendre l'exemple de e-regulation ou de e-registrations qui sont développés par euh, euh, UNCTAD, la CNUSED. Euh, ce sont des moyens qui permettent à nos agences d'avoir des solutions prêtes à l'emploi que le digital, ça demande beaucoup d'expertise technique, beaucoup de fonds, et là, on développe des solutions qui sont prêtes à l'emploi. Et on profite tous ensemble d'être formés sur comment utiliser ces solutions sans avoir besoin d'être développeur, codeur, ou de recruter des sociétés tierces dont le coût, pour certaines agences, est, est très élevé. Et donc ça, c'est quelque chose de, de, de très positif qu'il faut pouvoir renforcer. So thanks to those organizations that are gathering together all the IPS like WIPA, uh, Comoros, Comoros also is part of the COMESA one, and also of uh, um, an organization bringing all the francophone uh, IPS together. Um, what is important is to put in place a platform to have access to all this information, uh, to have access to uh, the procedure, the cost of those procedures, um, information about the investment opportunities, um, the, the bankable projects, and a second important thing is the uh, capacity building uh, for everyone to to use how to to know how to use those digital tools. So the example of the tools by UNCTAD, um, which are ready to to use tools, uh, it is great and also. Um, uh, because it comes along with a training to know to use those digital tools, and so it avoids uh, uh, countries to 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 pay and have additional costs for training and putting in place such tools. Je vais finir. En, je, je, je suis obligée de parler effectivement du programme qui a été développé par le CIR et la WIPA. Euh, destiné à renforcer les capacités des agences de promotion des investissements euh, francophones. Et ça ne s'invente pas, mais euh, on avait organisé à Moroni euh, dernièrement euh, une masterclass euh, sur la thématique de euh, utiliser l'intelligence artificielle pour promouvoir l'investissement. Donc nous sommes en plein dans le sujet, euh, avec des sujets très concrets qui ont été abordés en présence de toutes les agences. Et euh, on avait eu euh, un exercice très pratique où on a demandé à ChatGPT euh, alors, euh, tel pays, euh, quelles sont euh, les différentes euh, opportunités Si je dois faire ma stratégie de promotion de l'investissement, euh, quelles sont les différentes opportunités que je mettrai en avant Et euh, DPT nous a fait, un, nous a donné une réponse très intéressante pour euh, plusieurs de nos pays. <rire> Et, et, et donc, voilà, ces programmes servent également à voilà, accompagner euh, cette transition numérique euh, des agences pour être mieux au service du secteur privé en utilisant ces, ces nouveaux outils. So, to come back and refer to the EIF and WIPA joint project, uh, which is about uh, building capacity uh, 
for francophone uh, investment promotion agencies. So uh, recently in Moroni, they had a master class to know how to use uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, to promote investments. And one of the exercises was to ask ChatGPT uh, what could be the, invest, the um, promotion strategy to, uh, for each country, what would be uh, the points to, 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 to promote for uh, an investment uh, strategy. And the answers from the, chat, the AI, uh, AI was pretty interesting. Um, Thank you very much for sharing these examples, and I'm happy that I'm sh I would like to see the the, the really? answers from yeah, from yeah. ChatGPT actually. <laughs> yes, look forward to it. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Long, I would like to continue with you if I may. And you have a vast experience. You've been working with ASEAN. You have already mentioned some efforts that you have been uh, putting together at ASEAN. You've been also working with the WTO. Do you really think that the digitalization can help some developing countries and their voices to be heard better while the decision-making processes are being taking place? What is your opinion on that, if I may please? Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, my answers to your question is not from chat GBT. That's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, well, I have to start by saying that, you know, yeah. Yeah, let, let me continue with my answer. Uh, you know, digitalization should not be a barrier. I think that should be very clear. But it should be a catalyst for resilient, sustainable, and inclusive economic transformation, especially for the LDCs. Well, I, I, I will come back to this point at the end of my intervention. But uh, just similar to what I presented in my first intervention, I will first touch upon Cambodia's perspective and then the regional perspective from ASEAN, and then I'll come back, as I said, to my the, the point that I just made. Uh, for Cambodia, we, we strive to become a digital economy and a digital society by 2035. There is a policy framework in place. Uh, this policy framework is focusing on adopting and capturing and maximizing the benefits of uh, advances in digital technology uh, to increase productivity, economic efficiency, uh, boost uh, national economic growth and build a civilized society where uh, citizens can benefit uh, from the use of digital services uh, with high inclusiveness, reliability, and trustworthiness. At the ASEAN level, uh, we are on the path uh, to negotiate uh, an ASEAN digital economy framework agreement, what we call the DEFA. Uh, the DEFA uh, looks to accelerate inclusive digital transformation in ASEAN. Uh, thereby elevating ASEAN economic integration and com community building by embracing digital transformation for the benefits of its economic community and people. So uh, as we see, you know, from both national perspective and from the ASEAN perspective, there have, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on the development dimensions of digitalizations. So, you know, the national strategy and the regional framework, uh, we are putting people at the center, which is very important. So putting people at the center, having a people-centric approach, and focusing on inclusiveness, resilience, community, and society building. That is the main pillars of both the strategy, uh, the national and the regional framework. Uh, in terms of you know, participating in global trade discussion and negotiations, uh, I think what the developing countries, especially the LDC, needs is to bring these principles to the table. The principle of people-centered, inclusiveness, resilient, com community, society building, these, these are the, the principles that I mentioned. And then re reinforce the notion that you know, digitalization uh, should bring benefits and should not be a barrier for, for development. Uh, you know, developing countries, especially the LDCs, uh, you know, we should not be deprived of leveraging the benefits of digital technology just simply because, you know, as we all know, especially the LDCs, we're lacking, you know, access to the technology, there's lacks of human resource, there's lacks of workforce available, you know, and most importantly, the, you know, 
the, the limited infrastructure, digital infrastructure that we have. So this requires a lot of investments. But uh, you know, you know, to, 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 to overcome these challenges, I think what what we need to do is, you know, everyone needs to work together. You know, especially the the, the well off countries, the developed countries need to contribute. Uh, to uh, provide appropriate technical assistance to improve accessibility and you know infrastructure, obviously, uh, to build capacity, technology transfer, and other essential uh, supports to ensure that people can get benefits. Uh, and, and in terms of you know engaging, I think the LDCs we we still need to continue to engage you know in all the platforms when when we're talking about digitalization, e-commerce. Uh, digital trade or whatever, you know, we have to continue to engage. But I have to say that the platform for engagement it should be open, transparent, and inclusive. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, access to technology, access to workforce has, has been, let's say, one of the main challenges in LDCs and developing countries. Perhaps uh, private sector could have some options, some facilitations that could be provided. Uh, let's turn again to the to the representative from the private sector, to, to Ms. King, and uh, you know there are perhaps some cross-sectoral collaborations, if any, that can be enhanced by digitalization. Uh, have successfully achieved both corporate social responsibility and sustainability goals. I mean, additionally, in your role of government relations, uh, are there any, how do you see digital tools aiding governments? Let me put this this way. Um, the, the, are they, can they really utilize it in a efficient way? Or how these digital, uh, digital tools can be utilized in a more efficient way by governments as well as the private sector? What will be your well, yeah, I think it's become a lot easier. Um, one of the things that SAP still we still hear uh, out there is that this is a you know the this big old dinosaur in the software market that only uh, creates solutions for LEs for large enterprises that you can't afford mm -hmm. SAP software at, at the micro level, and that's just not true anymore. It hasn't been true for a long time. Eighty percent of the company's customers are SMEs. And uh, with the evolution of cloud models, uh, the whole licensing, the whole way we do business has changed, and the software is much more modular. So we have a lot of interesting developments at the front end uh, of, the, of the business. Uh, so you can think of a big mothership, and then there are all these speedboats uh, cruising around the mothership, developing new technologies with the help of startups. We do a lot of investment in startups. Um, of course, we're also interested in the talent and the new ideas, and, and so we develop partners and acquire take over some of these as well, but um, we also have intrapreneurs, so one interesting solution, we uh, just to cite a couple of examples that always makes it easier, um, is a solution we developed for the certification of, of green hydrogen, um, so that the, in the transport from start to finish, uh, you can keep track not only of the, is that is the hydrogen still green in the sense of uh, in the environmental, strictly environmental sense, but also as a digital twin for ESG reporting. So this is an entrepreneur solution that was developed in Australia uh, by an SAP employee, and we're now um, certified it with um, and worked on a partnership with GEZ, the German Technical Cooperation Agency, and are offering this uh, technology in partnership with governments and organizations that are interested. So in the um, Brazilian um, German delegation trip or the German consultations in the fall, um, we, we kicked that off in, in Brazil, but it is available as something that we could consider as just one example among hundreds uh, of a PPP. We do a lot with GateZ. Most mm -hmm. of it's on the capacity building, on the skills development side. As a German company, it just that's our first natural partner, so to speak, in that landscape. But um, there are also interesting opportunities in technology. Another one is uh, uh, something we did uh, in East Africa, a project on the Cashew Coast about traceability. So we created a rural sourcing management that on a mobile application, front end, small, modular, not the big SAP Cadillac that you would typically think of, um, to help um, process payments for the, for the farmer so that they could also track 
um, and, um, the uh, development of these uh, of the cashew from harvest to uh, to delivery. Though, of course, we have big solutions at the other end. I mean, supply chains. It's interesting to see what's going on in, in the private sector. We just um, opened the BMW just opened the first um, eye factory with a digital twin to monitor the entire supply chain with real data in the UK. That's their first global project. I only mention that in this context because it's uh, it's really a first for them and it's really only possible because they've been so long an SAP customer, they can use their own data. This is a huge advantage. Data is the new oil, right? We, most of the emissions monitoring we're doing, whether it's scope one, two, or three, is, is based on averages. Um, and this is a, a chance, of course, um, that, that an SAP can offer because we have a huge, uh, with 50 plus years of experience in 23 sectors, we have a huge database uh, of real-time data. It's customer data, so of course there's a process to go through to get this to, uh, to be open and accessible, but there is an enormous interest and there are a lot of smaller projects on this data sharing side too. So uh, from the small to the big, uh, there are a, a number of uh, opportunities for optimizing supply chains, real-time data, measuring carbon footprints, doing predictive planning, uh, measuring your performance against the achievement of SDG goals are just a few of the things that we're working on these days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, there are a lot of things to be done, apparently, for from all sides, not only private sector, but also from international institutions, as well as IPAs and trade institutions. So, if I may, I would like to turn to you now. If you have any questions uh, to our well, what's fast? It's coming. <laughs> Thank you, moderator, give the floor to ask one question. So, my name is Bo Yi, law professor from Southeast University at China. My question is to Ms. Nong. Thank you, Ms. Nong, for your comprehension and uh, enlightening presentation. I was particularly impressed by the depth of Cambodia's commitment to fostering sustainable growth through various strategy areas including the focus on the circular economy and the carbon neutrality. Your speech about Cambodia's sustainability database also caught my attention. It seems like an invaluable tool for promoting responsible trade and investment, and by providing transparency on sustainability elements in the use of organic materials and solar energy. So my question is, how is Cambodia's navigating this sustainability database to attract green investment additionally. Are there any plans to integrate this resource within the border Asian framework to naturally enhance sustainability growth and treat competitive competitiveness among our course member states? Thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. Uh have question, but I'll try to answer it anyway. Uh, the sustainability suppliers with the sustainability dimension, it's a, for me, it is a really great idea. It has never been done before in Cambodia. This is the first time that we ever compile or collate you know, all the SME into one single database. And that database not only provides you know, all the contact information on what kind of products and and, and services they are providing, and also in, uh, not only uh, the certificates, you know, all these certificates that uh, that they are complying with, but also with the sustainability dimension elements. And and uh, we we try to adapt this kind of approach in our other platform, what we call CambodiaTrade.com which is uh, uh, we received the funding and support from the EAF. And I want to highlight this, this CambodiaTrade.com platform a little bit because, as I said, we, like, we, 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 we try to adopt the sustainability approach because uh, the, the, the CambodiaTrade.com platform, we have 130 SMEs who are participating in the platform. It's an e-commerce platform, I have to say, uh, focusing on B2B, and also we have like some B2C uh, operations as well. And and we, we try to, you know, encapsulate what the sustainability database provides.
why you know all these sustainability elements we want to put it in 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 you know to to provide the buyers the business the consumers when when they when they come into the Cambodia trade platform they see whether these these this SME, these sellers, the vendors, whether they are, you know, pursuing any sustainability initiative by themselves. Uh, so, so these these two, you know, tools is very important in terms of outreaching, you know, to the wider market. Uh, for Cambodia Trade uh, dot com, we've been going around the region. We, I think, we went to. Korea to China to other places as well uh, to promote it because you know traditionally when you promote something promote a product or you promote a service you 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 know one company can go to trade fairs or exhibitions but that's only one company and if you want more you have to you know provide a lot of more resources to them because they will not simply go by themselves obviously larger you know SME they, they can afford to go but for for us you know all our SMEs are very very small you know micro SME so we have to provide them providing them with some support some hand holdings and 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 for you know for us we thought that you know we might as well bring about the trade dot com which has 130 SMEs just one one platform to the trade fair to the exhibition and then we can you know support all of them through this platform alone so uh, this is some 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 activities that we have already implemented but going back to your question regarding the ASEAN how we can connect with you know the wider <coughs> consumer base or wider you know business in ASEAN in fact there there was i think onlineasean.com that was just recently launched uh, during the uh, ASEAN Economic Ministers meeting in back in uh, yeah uh, earlier this month I think uh, this 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 uh, asianonline.com it's you know provide it's linked to the marketplaces and all the the sellers and vendors within ASEAN so what what we need to do next is try to link you know CambodiaTrade.com to the ASEAN online just to provide more accessibilities and, uh, and enabling environments for our SMEs to to reach out. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are we have only four minutes to go. Do you have any other questions? Please. Yes, uh, one of the things that we are doing in the, in order to um, improve the uh, investment climate in general, which is Im Im important for de-risking investment, actually, you know, bulk, bulk of the thing that that I was just mentioning this example of Bhutan, you know, bulk of the challenge is that for the investors is that you know you want to go there and have a big sort of digital infrastructure in place, and for which or you you want to set up a clean energy sort of plant. 
right? But then the major challenge that you have is the land acquisition, right? And, and that itself become a major risk. Right? So in order to address these challenges, the general and specific investment climate improvement that is required in LDC is the number one criteria, right? But number two, the, when I talk about very specifically de-risking, I'm basically t talking about the possibility of utilizing uh, public money, such as the resources that we provide to the country, or resources that comes from various ODA mode of financing, official development uh, assistance mode of financing, uh, or you know, government themselves putting in resources, or even you know, impact investors or somebody else putting in resources, or philanthropies putting in resources. These are all public money, right? So if you have a large chunk, you know, that's already sort of you know taken care of, and the 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 what how it blended finance works is that you know you have the 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 first loss layer that can be taken care of by you know, most of the public resources, and then you have mezzanine layer which can be taken care of by a combination of public and private investment, including now pension fund and insurance company, and the third layer which is profitable layer, and that. That's where the you know private sectors can come in. So that's the kind of model we are thinking of. We have not yet done anything in that regard, and this is where UNCDF, uh, an organization based in New York called United Nations Capital Development Fund, they are working by following this kind of modality, and we are also moving in that direction, thinking of moving in that direction. Thank we you. can discuss more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we are already on time now. We we should finalize. And let's see what AI said, what the AI's input for the closing remarks of today's discussion. I'll directly read from ChatGPT. Our discussions have underscored the undeniable truth. Digitalization is not merely a technological leap. It's our pathway to a sustainable future. By harnessing the power of digital tools, investment promotion agencies, and trade institutions can become pivotal change makers in the world of supply chains which is not bad, right? Thank you so much for participating. Thank you so much for being a great host. Thanks to all the participants.